pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see faces and good morning to those that are joining with us online. We just want to recognize you and welcome you to K First. Um, if you are new, uh, man, I'd love the chance to at least uh, to wave at you, air high five you, air hug. That sounds weird to say out loud, but hey, we can do that too. Um, just celebrating that you're with us to talk about uh, to talk about hope. We have been in a series called Hope Again over this past month, and we're going to wrap it up today. You're not going to want to miss next week. It is, um, I think it's one of the favorite, if not the favorite uh, preachers in all of K First. Uh, nobody ever wants to miss Pastor Juan preaching. So he is an absolute fireball. Uh, Pastor Juan will preach next week. And uh, then we're going to dive into a series called Culture of Blessing. And we're going to develop a culture of blessing here at K-First. And that's what February is going to be focused on. So if you have your Bibles, go to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, uh, a very familiar passage if you grew up in kids' church like me. Uh, Psalm 23 is one of those things that you memorized or uh, growing up in the assemblies of God. We had something kind of like a Christian Boy Scouts. We called it Royal Rangers. And so we had to memorize Psalm 23 to get a badge or a patch or something that we did in Royal Rangers. Um, but that was just a part of just our our. our Go to scriptures. John 3.16 is up there and Psalms 23 is another one of those. It simply says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. For he guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. And even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. For your rod and your staff, they protect and they comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies, and you hold my anointing head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing, for surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Lord, instill us with hope this morning. I pray that today that you would help to get our attention, Lord. That you would help us, God, to lift up our eyes from circumstances, from the situations that we have faced or are facing. Uh, God, that we would get our eyes firmly, firmly focused upon you, God. Knowing it's in you we find hope. It's in you that we receive hope. And it's you and you, God, that we get to be vessels of hope to the world around us. So Lord, today we say, speak, your servants are listening. Help us, Lord, not to leave this place or to even to leave the, um, the broadcast the same way that we clicked on. Change us somehow, some way to become more like you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Tis the season for change, and if you don't believe me, then uh, go drive by any fitness place that is around here and you will see you know, you're going to see the parking lot packed. In fact, I remember driving by a, a, a gym the other day with Ethan. I'm like, man, the parking lot is packed. He says, of course it is. It's January. It's the time of change. And I, for some reason, that's just what we do at the new year. We think about change. We invest in change. We want change. And so we start off doing some things, hoping that change, change is going to stick. Um, and speaking of change, I came across this. It said this, that a man dialed the wrong number and got the following recording. I'm not available right now, but I thank you for caring enough to call me. I am making some changes in my life. So please leave a message after the beep, and if I do not return your phone call, you're one of the changes. <laughs> if you need to, you can step out and go change your voicemail uh, before the message is done. Some of you right now are rethinking what is on your voicemail. But I don't know about you, we all desire change. We are all looking to change. And I believe the reason why, come around maybe mid-February or so, that those same gym parking lots that used to be full will not be as full. Um, you, you'll begin to see uh, people just kind of just maybe stepping back and into that which they've already, already known or what they've always known. And they will not step forward into change. And what I find is people usually stop going into change and they stop trying to change because they simply have lost hope. They've lost hope. And if there's anything that we as the church can't afford to lose and we can't afford to ignore, we can't afford to sit aside, it is hope because I believe that hope is the fuel for change. 
Hope is the fuel for change. It is what pushes us and propels us forward to do something about the condition that we are in or the conditions that we find ourselves in. Is We have the opportunity to move forward in hope. And as we've said so often, that our hope is not dependent upon anything of this world. Our hope comes from something higher, something beyond us. Our hope comes from the kingdom and it comes from Christ himself who is the hope of the world. And that's why we believe that hope is not something you do. Hope is not a goal to achieve. Hope is a perspective and it is a mindset. And it's something that I'm hoping that us as the body of Christ will always be about and it's hope. Because as long as Jesus is reigning upon the throne, ladies and gentlemen, there's always hope. As long as we have a resurrected Jesus, there's always going to be hope. And, and don't, be, don't be a butt here. You know what am I saying? Don't be one of those butt people. But what about this? Because I'm just going to turn it around and I'm going to butt you right back. But Jesus. But what, what about this? What about this situation? What about this law? But what about this rule? I'm here to tell you, one of the fastest growing churches in the world is the, is the church in China. In a place, in, in communist China, it is one of the fastest exploding churches in the entire world. Why? Because their hope is not in a system. Their hope is not in a people. Their hope is in Jesus. And when I look around at America, if there's anything that I wonder if God is calling us to repent, is us to repent of putting our trust in things that were not Jesus. And if we want fuel for change, we want fuel for revival, we want fuel for something new in our nation, I'm here to tell you that hope is Jesus. And that's what I want to draw us back to with this scripture. Perhaps the most famous psalm in all of the psalms, Psalm 23. Now, I'm preaching out of my, my New Living Translation, my normal preaching Bible, my Burgundy one, I actually date every single scripture that is my launching scripture for a message. Every time I've preached at K-First, starting on April the 4th, 2009, I, I, I circled and I, I put the little date in red and I underlined all of my starting scriptures in red. And I just, so I went back this week and I thought, how many times have I preached at K-First on a Sunday morning out of Psalm 23? Because I know it's a lot. It's once. One verse out of Psalm 23, but I know I've preached a lot out of it, but you know where I preach Psalm 23? Funerals. Why is it that Psalm 23 is only comfort for the morning? I'm here to tell you, Psalm 23 is hope for the, for the life, hope for the present. And so I want to just instill in your spirit hope today. My, my my hope is that you will walk out of here maybe with a challenge that says every single day this week, I'm going to read and I'm going to pray. I'm going to speak over somebody's life, hope out of Psalm chapter 23. And I'm going to help you find five things that we can draw hope from today. So if you have your Bibles, hopefully you have your Bibles. Uh, maybe you're an underliner, a circler, a highlighter. That's what I do in my Bible. Go for it. Look here, verse one. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. The Lord is my shepherd. Honestly, whenever you read the word shepherd, you should already have, like, have the, the, the lights go off because the word shepherd is prominently used all throughout the scripture. Uh, in fact, uh, Jesus uses shepherd and sheep as illustrations all throughout the Old Testament. Uh, the idea of shepherd and sheep and the Lord being our shepherd and we being his sheep is very prominent. In fact, some of the greatest uh, figures of scripture were former shepherds or have a background in shepherds. Think of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. Um, I can make arguments of Joseph. I can make arguments of, over a lot of individuals, specifically the one who wrote Psalm chapter 23, and his name is David. David started off as a shepherd before he ever became king. Before he became a giant killer, he was a shepherd. Uh, before he led armies, he was a shepherd. Uh, be, before, he, uh, before he led anybody, any groups, this is where he started off. And something you have to understand about shepherds is shepherds, rarely ever owned their own flocks. They normally managed other people's flocks, which means that shepherds themselves had to be people of high character because what they were doing is they were not going out to sleep into the field. They were going out to watch. They were going out to protect. They were going out to, to, to discipline. They were going out to save. They are going out to, to nurture the sheep that were put within their care. So when you hired a shepherd, you were doing more than just having somebody just sit with animals. You're having somebody protect your investment. You are trusting in their character. 
So when you read Psalm chapter 23, verse one, and it says, the Lord is my shepherd, you can begin to see that David is talking about the character of God. And so if you're taking notes, write this down. Hope is found in the character of God. Hope is found in the character of God. David roots his hope in God's character. And he sits in that place because he knows he can trust in the one that provides, the one that protects, the one that disciplines, the one that acts like a shepherd, that operates like a shepherd. He trusts in the character and therefore he can have hope in him. You see, there's two ways to live in this world. As a, as a believer, there's two ways that we can live. We can live in such a way where we can go before God every single day and we can tell God how big our problems are or we can be a different type of, a type of Christ follower as we can go to our situations and begin to speak to our situations how big God is. We can live in such a way that constantly tells God, here's how big the issue is. Here's how bad 2020 is. Here's how, here's how hopeless I feel about 2021. Or we can step on the other side because we know we've got a shepherd watching over us. We know we've got a shepherd taking care of us. And instead of speaking to God about our issues, what if we went to our issues and we begin to speak to God, speak to them about our God? Let me tell you how big my God is. I know I've, got, I've been given a diagnosis, but let me tell you about my healing God. Here's the, here's the chaos, but let me tell you chaos about the peace that passes understanding. I serve the Prince of, of Peace. What if, what if we begin to draw hope from the character of God and we begin to speak that character into the situations that we are in? God, raise up a church that is, is no longer going to constantly, constantly lift up how big the issues are. Lord, help us to drop those at your feet and begin to lift up your name and speak your name over those issues. Help us to be a people that will walk with that authority that gets hope because we trust in the character of who God is. You see, when we remind ourselves of who God is and we declare who God is, that alone should produce hope in our lives. That alone. That's why we start off worship, we start off services with worship. I love just speaking out the character of God. I love speaking out who He is. I love declaring what He is in my life because that alone produces hope. And now hope can be the fuel for the change that I know God desires to see in my life. To be quite honest, the type of desire or the change I want to see in my own life. So hope is rooted in the character of God. But we don't just find hope in the character of God. We find hope in the rest of God. Read along with me. It says, he lets me rest in green meadow meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Let's step back. Verse two, he lets me rest. Rest in green meadows. Again, we got a lot, of, uh, a lot of pasture and sheep metaphors that are going on here, but we can find hope in the rest of God. Now, if you've ever studied the word rest, and I've had a series brewing for like 10 years on the Sabbath, we'll do it someday, but if you ever study the word rest or the issue of rest, you'll know that it is the very first spiritual practice we ever see exercised in all of scripture. Genesis chapter two, we see that God created and on the seventh day he rested, and yet what's wild is, is God chooses to rest. Did God need to rest? God was not tired. He did not need to rest. He was actually doing something and setting up a pattern for us to follow, but yet in this world is we, we work ourselves, and whether it's our fingers, our minds, our lives, we get ourselves in such a frenzy seven days a week, 24 hours a day, with something in our back pocket that keeps us attuned to every bit of life, every bit of culture, everything that's going on. We can't ever set aside anything in order to simply get ourselves rest, and it's no wonder why we have no hope, but we find hope in the rest of the Lord. And in fact, if you ever study the Ten Commandments, uh, you could read them in uh, Exodus chapter 20. I mean, look, Exodus chapter 20, when God says to observe the Sabbath, that Ten Commandment of observing rest is actually the most, is the longest worded commandment out of all the Ten Commandments. Why? Because he was speaking to a people that had just come out of slavery in Egypt. They worked seven days a week, endlessly, tirelessly, because if they didn't work, they died. 
And so God is trying to rescue them out of this mindset that I think us as Americans in the Western world, that we can tend to serve, that we have to work, we have to work and we have to be busy seven days a week or else something will die. But I wonder if God is trying to draw us into a place that perhaps the reason why we have no hope is because we're spending it on a lack of rest. And that's why even in Deuteronomy chapter five, Deuteronomy Deuteronomy chapter five, there's a new generation of Israel. And so Moses pens out the 10 commandments again, but he actually rewords this commandment. Instead of saying, remember the Sabbath, he actually writes out in Deuteronomy uh, chapter five, he says to observe. So me, instead of observe, it is remember. Remember the Sabbath, why? Because there is a generation that has been born, a generation that has been raised up. They themselves may not have been enslaved in Egypt, but he said, listen, just because you didn't live what your forefathers did doesn't mean that this law means any less. You need to look back and remember. Because when it comes to our spiritual life, for some of us, think, we think it's all about trying harder. If we worship harder, sing louder, do more, then we can get closer to God. But I'm here to really challenge that mindset that it's not about trying harder with God, it's about coming closer. And one of the greatest spiritual practices that you can ever exercise in your walks with God is actually rest. I've had people say, well, well, that sounds, uh, this, it sounds counter to actually getting closer to God. But I wonder if some of us have gotten so busy trying to do things for God that we haven't heard the still voice of God just saying, slow down and doing exactly what Pastor Abby talked about and just simply resting. Because we can get so busy that we can actually miss out on what God is speaking, what God is showing, and what God is trying to do inside of our life because we're so busy working, trying to get something that we can get by resting. And so quite often people ask me about Sabbath and ask me about rest. And if you ever need a great book, um, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by, by Pete Scazzaro, he will talk about rest. There's a whole section on rest. It is powerful. I've walked people through the book. Um, I challenge people that if you can't take 24 hours, split it in half, do 12-hour sections of rest. But here's what you do if you really want to find hope in rest today. There's three questions that you can ask yourself to guide you through it. Number one, what is going to make me love Jesus more today? Number two, What's gonna make me love life more today? Then number three, what do I get to do, not what do I have to do? You want a simple way to navigate rest and find hope in rest again? Because rest was not meant to be something that is heavy upon us. I I grew up in in a a type of belief about the Sabbath that on on our day of rest that we, we weren't really supposed to do anything. I've, had, I've known people, we don't go to restaurants, we don't go do anything, we don't do anything around the house. We don't, it's, Sabbath is not simply about doing nothing. Sabbath is this, it's what's going to make me love Jesus more today? What is going to make me love life more today? And what is it that I get to do? And not that I have to do it, but what do I get to do today? And watch this, as you take that moment of rest in your spiritual walk, as you begin to exercise that which God established in, in, in Genesis chapter two, Exodus chapter 20, and Deuteronomy chapter five, watch the spirit of God begin to birth hope in your life again. Some of us have yet to breathe hope because we're too busy grasping for air at the pace of life that we have been living. So we have to rest. Number three, so we find hope. We find hope in God's character. We find hope in God's rest. Number three, we find hope in God's guidance. We find hope in God's guidance. When I grew up, whenever we took a trip, uh, my parents had AAA and we had what we call trip ticks. Anybody ever use a trip tick? Anybody? Everybody's my age on up, there we go. Nobody else knows what a trip tick is. Uh, What a trip tick is, is this is pre-internet, pre-GPS, is we would go, like for example, I remember going to AAA because I was taking my first trip by myself back to college, no parents with me whatsoever. And I said, I'm gonna start in Detroit, I'm going to Springfield, Missouri, 880 miles. And so what they did was they put together this, it's like a little flip chart. And it's just sections of road, a little bit at a time, 
that you just use to follow along. They would circle construction areas. They would highlight spots that could be high traffic. And it was honestly a beautiful thing. So I'd attach it to my dash, my dash and I would just flip it as, we, as I would drive down myself after we got away from trip, trip ticks. I don't know if anybody's ever had an Atlas in their car. I had a big old honking thing, absolutely. Uh, I have people look at me like I'm weird, getting no GPSs. And then God cursed us with MapQuest. Dear Lord the worst of the worst. I think we've all had map quests where we printed off directions that took us to the place that we did not want to go whatsoever. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And the GPSs came out that sometimes worked, unless you're driving in the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden it lost signal and then you're just sunk. What did we do? We had triptychs. But I mean, think about this. When it comes to direction and guidance, there's not a single person within the sound of my voice that doesn't crave that for their life. It is one of the most asked questions I have as a pastor. When I sit down for people, for counsel, when people come talk to me, they want direction. They want guidance. Pastor, help me make this decision. And I usually kind of do. Because normally it's like, Pastor, just tell me what to do. And I don't like, I'm like, I don't want that much power. Some of you would love that much power over everybody's life. But it's all, we want guidance. We crave guidance. We crave direction. And for some of us that we, we are so busy seeking for it from other things or from somebody that we have yet to truly silence ourselves and learn to seek it from God. I'm gonna give you the most two ignored, most simplistic ways to get direction for your life. This may sound overly simple, but according to stats that I'm seeing of the overall church are, is the two largely most ignored areas to get answers from God. Number one is the scriptures. Psalms 119 says that your word, let me go old school King James, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. There are some of us that we are praying for direction, we're praying for guidance that God has already given it to us, that if we would just crack open our Bibles, we would actually help hear the voice of God. Some of us, it's not about your hearing. Some of you, it's about your reading and your diving into, because there are times that God has already given the word. God has already spoken something. And if we can open up our Bibles, I promise we're going to begin to see direction for our lives. And the second thing I would challenge you to do is what we're finding ourselves in is prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. This is our last week of prayer and fasting, and I'm going to challenge you to be a people of prayer and fasting. One of, uh, one of the most quintessential scriptures in my life for prayer and fasting, it spoke to me in Bible college, it was Acts chapter 13, but when it says that as the church was praying and fasting, the Spirit of God said, set aside Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I want to do. And so what they did next was they went back in the prayer and fasting and they laid their hands upon them and they sent them off. If you want to hear from the Lord, Leas, I don't mind you talking to your pastor. I'm honored that you would talk to me, but it is rare that I find somebody that comes to talk to me that has actually spent time in the scriptures and prayer and fasting. In fact, I've got a friend of mine that says that for every person that wants to come see him for pastoral counsel, he makes them spend a half hour in the prayer room. He says, man, nobody ever calls me up for counseling. <laughs> Imagine if we sought the scriptures and we sought the Lord, not just with prayer, but with fasting. What is fasting? Fasting is this, I wrote this down. It is an attempt to quiet down the voices that are the loudest. It is to suppress the yearnings that are the strongest. It is there to clear away the distractions in our lives so that the voice of God is amplified and we can actually get direction. Do you hear what fasting is? Fasting is more than just skipping a meal. To me, fasting is whatever is important to me. I set that aside and I dedicate that time now to the Lord and I'm giving the Lord that time so that I can quiet down voices. Some of us need to quiet down social media voices and the best way to do it is not to, it's not to simply turn off your phone. Why not just disconnect yourself from those other voices? Uh, for some of us, it's turning off the news. For some of us, it's stepping away from some friendships for a season. For some of us, it's moving to a time where we set aside something that we just spent a lot of time on, and we dedicate that to the Lord. Why? Because we want to amplify the voice of God and to set aside distractions so we can find guidance. And when we find his guidance, we will find hope because wherever God directs you, he will empower you for that. 
Whatever God directs you, he'll empower you to do that. Number four, we find hope in his presence. We find hope in his presence. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, verse four, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. For your rod and your staff, they protect and comfort me. You prepare a table, a feast before me in the presence of my enemies. And you, anoint, you honor me by anointing my head with oil and my cup overflows with blessing. I love this portion. He finds hope in the presence of God. But something that I want you to notice, if you've got, your, you've got the scriptures up here on, on the screens here, but if you've got your Bibles, I want you to notice the differences between the verbiage that David uses in verses one through three, and then we get into verse four and five. Because he goes from, he's talking about God as a he. He does this and he does this, but when he goes to the darkest valley, he begins to change it from saying, he does this to saying, God, you do this. There's a verbiage change, grammar change that takes place. And it really signifies, I mean, look at the differences where he's talking about, I'm beside still waters. He does this when, the, when life is good, but all of a sudden when pain hits and when stress hits and when chaos hits, he immediately talks about, instead of he, he talks about you. God, you do this in my life because there's something about chaos and there's something about challenge. There's something about pain. There's something about these, these situations that make us go from serving God from a distance to pushing closer and saying, God, I need to be closer. I need the you. I love that change. Something about the stress of life that makes us draw closer to God. And what I love about that type of challenge is that not only do we want to draw closer to God, but it seems like God draws closer to us. I love Bible Gateway. If you've never used BibleGateway.com, it is just my go-to um, Web, uh, website for looking up scriptures. I use the parallel Bible in there. And I just did a, a quick survey of the New Living Translation. I just typed the word hope in, hit enter, and I looked across the board because I wanted to find out where is the word hope used the most in scripture? And I'll give you the top three. Number one, book of Psalms. Number one. Number two, the book of Job. You know what the book of Job is about? Uncertainty. Travesty. Loss discouragement. That's the book of Job. You're like, that's why I've never read the book of Job. Uh, number three, most used hope in the entire scripture, Jeremiah. What's Jeremiah about? Tragedy, captivity, loss, frustration. The three books of the Bible where we see the most hope presented is where there's the most challenge presented. And what that tells me is not only does the psalmist want to draw near to, the God, near to the Lord, but in the midst of the hardest times in Scripture, we see that hope is present the most. God is not detoured by your brokenness. He is attracted to you. And he draws near to you. And when you need him most, when we're the psalmist and we're broken, when we're Job and we have questions about why things have happened, when we're Jeremiah and we're weeping over the loss and the destruction that we see around us, it is in those places where hope rises up because there is hope in the presence of God. We can find hope. And a psalmist says that when I walk through the darkest valley, it doesn't say if I walk through the valley, if I go through rough stuff, it says when I do, guess what? You are there, which tells us that the psalmist says, that the God doesn't help us to avoid it. He gives us his presence. And the, his presence is what guides us through the darkest of times. And sometimes God delivers us from the darkness. Sometimes God delivers us through the darkness. But whether or not the promise is this, his presence will be with us and he will deliver us through it all. And I don't know what 2021 has planned for you. I don't know what you have planned for 2021. I don't know the unknown, but this is one thing that I do, is I can go into this year with hope. Why? Because his presence is with me. Now notice this. Here's shepherding stuff here from a shepherd. 
It says in verse four, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. If you would circle those two words, uh, because those are important, and also circle the word comfort. Why? Because the rod and the staff, they were instruments of a shepherd. The staff there, it tapped and guided the sheep. When, if a sheep fell down a hole, the shepherd's crook turned upside down, lifted the sheep out of the hole. And in that rod there, the rod was there not just, it's almost like a baseball bat. It not just fended off any type of predators, but sometimes, not that he needed to club the sheep, but sometimes he used, he kind of would hit the t- side of the sheep in order to get the sheep to listen. So when we look at the comfort and the discipline of the rod and the staff, David says this, that they comfort me. They give me hope. That word comfort in the Hebrew language comes from the word breath. That even in the midst of God's comfort, in the midst of God's discipline, in the midst of his presence, it is there that he breathes hope into you and I. We find hope in his presence. Lastly, Jared, if you could join me out here on the the keyboard, that'd be great. Number five, we find hope in faithfulness. We find hope in faithfulness. Verse six, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. That word pursue, That word pursue is a hunting term in the Hebrew language that means that surely goodness and unfailing love will pursue me, will hunt down after me all the days of our lives. The first time I ever looked up that that, that word was when I was reading Psalm 23 at my grandfather's funeral and I remember it just absolutely locked in on my own spirit because when I feel like I had nothing left to give, when I felt like I had no strength to pursue God, the beauty is this, is when I was on empty, there was still the spirit of God that was constantly pursuing you, showing himself faithful, that when I didn't know what to pray, God showed up and he was faithful. When I didn't know what to say in a situation, God showed up and he was faithful. I've been called, I've been as a pastor called into so many tragic situations and there are times that I've shown up and I've sat in my car and I'm just like, Lord, I, I don't even know what to even be in this moment. But can I tell you this? He's faithful. We can find hope in God's faithfulness. That's what the psalmist says. We can find hope in his faithfulness because his His love and goodness will hunt us down. Do you know why we sing on Sundays? It's to remind ourselves of God's faithfulness. It's to remind ourselves that we can hope again because he's here and he's with us. I wanna read you a scripture, Psalm chapter 28, verses seven. Do we have that on the screen? Psalm chapter 28, verse seven. The Lord is my strength and shield and I will trust him with all my heart. He helps me and my heart is filled with joy and I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. I love one translation says that each generation will hope. We sing, we hope because sometimes we lose our way and we need someone to come in that we can trust, that we can lean on and that can fill us all over again. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. About a thousand years ago, excuse me, about a thousand years later, after David had penned these words in Psalm chapter 23, Jesus stood in front of a crowd. And in John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says these words, I am the good shepherd. I can imagine some of the listeners in the crowd that would have grown up with the oral tradition of hearing the Psalms of David or, or, or hearing that Psalm maybe read in, in, to, in their synagogue, maybe hearing their parents talk about, man, the, the, how King David thought of God as their shepherd. And then Jesus stood in front of a crowd and he just simply says, I am your good shepherd. I'm there to guide you. I'm there to give you hope. I'm there to give you peace. I'm there to be faithful to you. I'm there to give you hope when all hope is all lost. I'm there to be your shepherd. And there's anything that I've heard of some, from so many people is how alone they feel right now. They may feel alone because they feel quarantined off from everybody. They feel alone because when they, when they go to talk with people, they see nothing but masks. They feel alone because they, they, they feel like they can never find anybody that can see eye to eye with them on their ideals or their politics. If people feel so alone because they can't connect and they can't hug like they wanna do. But I'm here to help you understand that even in the midst of this moment that you don't have to feel alone because there's somebody with you. 
And even though 2021 may have a lot of unknowns, that just because we feel what feels unknown doesn't mean that you are alone. You've got somebody with us, someone that David called a shepherd. And we can find hope in his character. We can find hope in his rest. We can find hope in his guidance. We can find hope in his presence. And we can find hope in his faithfulness. And we cannot just find that. We can open up 23 and begin to speak that over the people in our life. He has come to give us hope so we can act in it, we can walk in it, we can live in it, and we can spread it. I love it, uh, Romans 15 says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. God wants to fill us with hope. He wants you to be a vessel of hope. I was reading an article that just kind of came through and it was about storms. And it was actually talking about like hurricanes and tsunamis and the effects it has on wildlife, specifically fish out into the deep because you know we talk about those things when they hit the coast but we don't really think much of them when they're out in the middle of the ocean you know ever think about what do fish do during these things what happens what does wildlife do well quite simply they go to a deeper place and this article said that fish whenever there is a storm of that type of magnitude that is over the surface all they have to do is they have to swim down 26 feet. And when they get at 26 feet, they are now at a, a perfect depth where they know what's happening above them, but they are no longer affected by it because of the depth that they have now gone. And I don't know what chaos that you might be facing today, but I'm gonna ask you today, would you go 26 feet deep? Like, what does that even mean? Would you take your faith deep in Jesus today? Would you put faith in Jesus today? You wanna to find hope? Hope is only found in Christ. You want hope for your marriage? It's only found in Christ. Hope over your children, hope over your grandchildren, hope, hope in your job, hope in the finances that you need to make it through this year, hope in uh, what schools can or is, are not gonna look like. Stop trying to find your hope in, in the storm that is happening around us. Sometimes we've gotta go a little bit deep and we gotta go deeper into who he is. And some of you today, it is time for you to stop playing games with God and start going deep with him. And today, I'm gonna to challenge you to put your faith 26 feet deep, to get down deep underneath the storm and get to the place where hope captures your heart all over again, where hope is birthed something and it's gonna give you life. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, I ask that today that you would just speak in the hearts and breathe hope again. Hope again. The title of my message today, as you're listening, the title of the message is Hope Lives Here. And maybe you're here today and you would simply say, Pastor Dave, hope doesn't live here in my heart because I'm not really living for God. I'm not in a relationship with God. I'm, I am not living for Jesus whatsoever. And today what I would do, what I want to do is not leave you in a place where you can walk away and just stay in that place. I want hope to enter in. Hope is found in the presence of the Lord and the presence of the Lord is here. But I'm going to challenge you to do this is instead of just letting hope linger around you in this place, I want hope to linger inside you in this place, your heart. I'm gonna challenge you to go 26 feet deep. I'm gonna challenge you to separate yourself from the storm and to go deep with the Lord by simply inviting him into your life. And if you're here today and you're not in a relationship with Jesus, but you're ready to step into that, if that's you today, you're ready to go 26 feet deep. You're ready to go deep. You're ready to take that step and bring hope inside here. If that's you, real quickly, would you just lift up your hand saying, Pastor Dave, that's me. I'm ready to start hoping again. I need a relationship with Christ. I just wanna look around and give opportunity. I wanna be able to do this every single Sunday and allow people to have the chance to ask Christ into their life. Just let me look around just a few minutes here, a few seconds here. 
Just a few seconds. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I see the hand, bud. You can put that hand down. That's awesome. Anybody else? The title is Hope Lives Here. That's what we're asking God to do is hope live here. If you, For that person that lifted their hand and for maybe a right now and say these words, Jesus, I invite you in to my life because I need hope to live inside here. Today, I go that 26 feet deep. I separate myself from the chaos that has been life, the hopelessness that has been life, the storms that I have been focused on. And Lord, today, I want my life to go deeper today by trusting in you. And so today, I put my life's trust in your hands. I know I'm a sinner, but I know you're a savior. And I ask that you would just give me new life and new hope today as I turn my life towards you. Lord, I pray over individuals putting their trust in you right now that you would do a magnificent transformative work in them, that you would help them to follow you, God. You would help us to help them to follow after you. Spirit of God, move in their life. Guide them and lead them. I pray that Psalm 23 would be their anthem this week, God, as they read it over and over and over. Let them be reminded that there's hope in your presence. There's hope in your rest. There's hope in your guidance. There's hope in who you are, God. There's, there's hope in your faithfulness that is with us every step of the way. Lord, I pray over every individual with the sound of my voice that, Lord, that you would, that they, it would be said of them that hope lives here and that they would do more than just hoard hope, God, that they would be vessels and conduits of hope wherever they go wherever they, you take them. And Lord, as you take us through this week of prayer and fasting, as we're wrapping up these 21 days, I pray that Lord, hope would come alive more than ever before. And God, that you would just birth vision and dreams and purpose in us, God. That we would, everywhere we go, God, that we would be so saturated with hope from our prayer time, that wherever we go, we just have this aroma of hope that infiltrates every aspect of our life. Today we proclaim hope lives here. We pray that all